Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Bob Goodlatte, and I am a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and a member of the uh, House Agriculture Committee and the uh, House Judiciary Committee. Uh, and this is a forum on the, the new farm bill that we're trying to pass through the, <laughs> the Congress. Uh, I, uh, last week, actually uh, uh, changed hats and became the chairman of the uh, House Judiciary Committee, uh, which has a keen interest in, thank you very much, uh, a keen interest in a wide array of, uh, of technology issues. Uh, we have uh, jurisdiction over um, antitrust law, intellectual property law, criminal law, immigration law. Uh, so there are a number of areas that you can just uh, look at that list to see that uh, we will be following very closely. But one that we have uh, uh, watched very closely for a number of years uh, is the internet governance issue. And we have a great panel here for you today, which I'll introduce uh, in just a couple of minutes, uh, that all have uh, real hands-on experience. Uh, most of the panel uh, were in Dubai recently for the recent uh, uh, conference related to this very issue and can share some great remarks. This, uh, however, is a very, very important issue that we should pay close attention to because the Internet has grown and succeeded because it has received a light touch uh, of governance uh, over uh, its many years of growth. Uh, it, it stems out of uh, government research and uh, uh, university research, but as it has grown, it has primarily grown by uh, individual initiatives of uh, uh, people and companies in the private sector who've had great ideas and have helped to, uh, to grow the Internet. And it's important that we keep it that way. Therefore, the question, which is the title of our, our uh, program here, some countries want the UN to regulate the internet, so what's the problem, uh, is, is pretty easily answered. And uh, what we really need to pay attention to is what's going on and what can we do to assure uh, that an internet that is uh, free of uh, international government regulation, and, and, and quite frankly, in most instances, uh, government regulation as well. Obviously, nations must work to, together to address issues affecting the Internet's growth and stability, such as crime, cybersecurity, online privacy. And you need organizations like ICANN to make sure that uh, the assignment of names and numbers uh, is done in a sensible fashion. However, there's no question that Internet governance issues are best addressed through multi-stakeholder mechanisms as they have been successfully done for many years. I'm very skeptical of any attempt by unaccountable intergovernmental entities to usurp control of the Internet from the private, nonprofit, and governmental organizations that have managed the Internet effectively for many years and empowered it to flourish. In fact, I would predict dire consequences if the Internet is managed by uh, the UN or other intergovernmental entities. Our cherished notions of free speech would be put at serious risk with a possible balkanization of the Internet where censorship could become the new norm. We need to nurture free market principles, the freedom of the Internet, the freedoms of speech and the press, and limited bureaucratic involvement in order to ensure that the Internet and the innovation associated with it continues to thrive. In Congress, I serve as one of four co-chairmen of the Congressional Internet Caucus, a caucus made up of more than 100 members of the House and Senate, working to promote the promise, potential, and the absolutely critical role the Internet plays in our economy, our democracy, and our culture. In November, all four co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus signed a letter to Ambassador Kramer before he left to lead the United States delegation to the World Conference on International Telecommunications in Dubai. We conveyed to him that Congress is unified in its support for the idea that the global Internet should remain free from government control and that the multi-stakeholder process upon which the Internet has grown exponentially is a proven model that will enable the Internet to continue to thrive for the benefit of citizens around the globe. Indeed, the House of Representatives voted for a resolution dec declaring these very principles with an overwhelming majority, 414 bipartisan members supporting it. House Concurrent Resolution 127 was passed by the House of Representatives without a single dissenting vote. The Senate passed a similar resolution, Senate Concurrent Resolution 50, by unanimous consent, 
without a single dissenting vote. There's little doubt that some countries will continue to push for more control of the internet, so the United States must continue to be vigilant. I want you to know that as chairman of the House Committee on the Judiciary and co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, I will continue to jealously guard internet freedoms and defend against intergovernmental entities like the UN obtaining control over this extraordinary medium. And now I'd like to introduce our panel and uh, for some of our panel members, I have uh, full-page, single-spaced uh, introductions, and uh, with apologies to them, uh, you can uh, uh, do a little research on the internet if you want more background. I'm, I, I suspect most people in the room are capable of doing it right while you sit right where you are, but I will tell you a little bit about each because we have uh, a very distinguished panel. First, our moderator is going to be David Gross, who is a partner at Wiley Rhine. I know him best as our former ambassador uh, to uh, these international telecommunications uh, associations. And he's one of the world's foremost experts on international telecommunications, having addressed the United Nations General Assembly and led more U.S. delegations to major international telecommunications conferences than anyone in modern history. Uh, next, we're fortunate to be joined by uh, uh, a long-standing member of the Federal Communications Commission. Robert McDowell was first appointed to a seat on the FCC by President George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the Senate in 2006. When he was reappointed to the commission in June of 2009, he became the first Republican to be appointed to an independent agency by President Barack Obama. He was unanimously confirmed by the Senate on June 25, 2009. He's a graduate of Duke University and the Marshall Wythe School of Law at the College of William and Mary, and he's admitted to practice in uh, more jurisdictions than I am, uh, including the U.S. Supreme Court, and he resides in Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, a definite plus. Uh, and what he says is what's left of the farm where he grew up with his wife, Jennifer, and their three children. David Reddell, am I pronouncing correctly, uh, comes from the uh, House Committee on Energy and Commerce, where he works for Chairman Fred Upton. Uh, and uh, in his role with the committee, he works with, the, with communications and technology, uh, uh, the subcommittee, and with a specific focus on spectrum issues. Uh, prior to joining the Energy and Commerce Committee, he served as Director of Regulatory Affairs at CTIA, uh, and he is a graduate of the um, Georgetown University Law Center and Bowdoin College. He lives in Baltimore, Maryland with his wife and two children. I think it's you. Pablo, what's that? That's Eric. Eric lives in Baltimore. Oh. With Dave's wife and children. Oh, yes. you're right. <laughs> Actually, you're right. My, my editing skills here, uh, I jumped right down through Eric, but... Eric Loeb is the VP of <laughs> International External Affairs for AT&T, where he's responsible for supporting AT&T's team of international external affairs advocates. AT&T is a premier global communications company, as you know, providing wholesale services and mobile roaming services to over 220 countries and territories, and providing business enterprise services to countries representing over 99% of the world's economy. He's the graduate of Georgetown University Law Center uh, and uh, Bowdoin College. And uh, Mr. Reddell's a graduate of Penn State University with his JD from uh, Catholic University of America. We now have that straight. Pablo Chavez uh, gave me by far the shortest introduction, so I'm going to read all of it. He's the director of public policy and governmental affairs for Google, and he's uh, joined Google in 2006 after having worked for Senator John McCain as chief counsel and the Senate on the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation as a senior counsel there. John Branscombe is a professional member of the Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, and the Internet on that very same committee, the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, where he works for Senator Rockefeller. Uh, he is Majority Counsel for Communications and Media Issues uh, with the Senate Committee, and uh, I don't know where he went to school, but I'm sure he has outstanding Virginia Tech undergrad in WNL Law. There you go. 
my district. So I should know that, right? Well, folks, uh, we have a great panel. Uh, even before they open their mouths, let's give them a round of applause and <laughs> welcome David Gross. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. I really appreciate that uh, introduction as well as the opening remarks. And let me just begin by uh, noting that uh, the Chairman uh, is a particularly good choice to, uh, to begin our conversation here. Uh, he played uh, one of the key roles in uh, uh, the World Summit on the Information Society, which was a UN Heads of State Summit that we'll talk about in a moment, because it was really the precursor to the Wicket uh, Conference that we just recently had. And his role was instrumental in uh, passing uh, a resolution in the House uh, that was also passed by the Senate uh, back in 2005 that was very similar to the one that was just done this past year uh, that was also instrumental in preserving our internet freedoms and rights uh, at that time as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for, for all that you've done and continue to do for, uh, for the American people. Let me just begin by a couple of comments and let me also note that uh, uh, we're going to be opening this up for questions from the audience. Uh, sooner, I think, rather than later, so give a chance for everyone to participate. Uh, I thought what I would do is just begin by setting the scene uh, by a few comments, and then we're going to go uh, to Q&A with, uh, with our extraordinary panel. Uh, at its core, uh, as the chairman indicated, this is a good news story. What I mean by that is that only about a decade or so ago, uh, the Internet was of importance only in the United States, Europe, Japan, and a few other developed world countries. And when you traveled, as I had the opportunity to do, to go to the developing world and have conversations about the internet, you were basically met with either stares, not because they didn't understand, but what, they didn't understand why we were talking about it. Because technology traditionally has come very late and has had very little direct impact on the quality of lives of people in most of the developing world. In an extraordinarily short period of time, within a decade or so, the internet has proven, particularly with the advance of wireless services, to be something fundamentally different. And so today, we are having this discussion, as we did a few years ago for the WISIS, because the world recognizes the importance of the internet to their lives, to their economies, to their culture, and to their future. And so as we have this conversation about the importance of internet freedom, the importance of who makes the decisions about the internet from a technical and from a policy perspective, it is, in my view, important to remember the extraordinary nature of this discussion and the fact that it is, in fact, the rest of the world that finds these issues to be of such importance. Our story today begins, in many respects, in 1988, when the ITU had its first session, its first wicket in essence, uh, where it negotiated in a very difficult environment the international telecommunications regulations that, in fact, are not really regulations, but a treaty. And back then, in the pre-internet days, the focus was really on the fact that it was most countries, with the United States and a few exceptions, but not many, still had their telephone services provided by PTTs, by state-owned monopolies. And so the negotiations between governments on international telephony was a natural thing to have happen. One of the things that was unusual about that treaty was the fact that there was a very important but little noticed provision that said that for countries and that had private carriers like the United States, that they could be free to go forward and to negotiate their own deals. That, of course, that exception to the rule back in 88, through the importance of liberalization, that the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, the part of the UN that we're talking about, played an important role in advocating, as did the FCC, as did the US government and certain other governments, that liberalization resulted in the fact that today most governments are out of the telephone business, at least directly, and that private industry leads the way. 
Back in 2003 and 2005, as we mentioned a moment ago, the UN recognized the importance of internet and international telephony, but particularly the internet, and held what in the United Nations is the highest and most important types of meetings, a heads of state summit. 2003, there was great discussion about internet governance with no real resolution. 2005, the world was looking for changes in the way in which the internet was governed. The U.S. led a very small but vocal coalition, and thanks to the actions by Congress and by others, we were able to ensure that, in fact, the U.N. at that time did not change the mechanisms for how the Internet was governed. However, the seeds were born at that time, or started to, to germinate, such that governments said, we want to continue this discussion. And they found as a mechanism this 1988 treaty, the ITRs, and said that we, it's time after now 24 years to revisit that old treaty, and that that might be, in the view of some governments, the mechanism to bring internet governance to the United Nations or to some other organization. That brought a number of people on this panel, uh, and many of the people I see in the audience, to Dubai for two weeks, the first two weeks of December. Uh, not for early Christmas shopping, uh, I have to quickly add, for many reasons, but rather to negotiate uh, this treaty. In all the years that I've been doing international telecoms, I don't believe there has ever been more written before an international treaty conference involving telecommunications and the internet than before Wicket. There was certainly nothing as much written during the conference about that. And by based on the number of articles I've been continuing to read, certainly nothing since then. It was an extraordinarily important conference. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what happened at that conference, and perhaps more importantly, where we go from here. So let me begin, if I may, with a, asking those on the panel, starting with the commissioner, who had a number of days in Dubai uh, at the conference, to give us a little bit of your impressions about the conference, how it was different from what you anticipated, and what lessons we might learn just from the optics and from seeing what was going on there. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, for those of you who don't know David Gross, he's selling himself a little bit short when he talked about these efforts in 2003 and 2005, and really any time between 2001 and 2009 and those efforts were turned back. They were turned back mainly because of uh, the energy and wisdom and insight and just plain hard work of this man right here, David Gross. Uh, so he deserves the, the credit for that. Um, and thank you for putting together this panel uh, very much. So, you know, to kind of answer your question, what was the wicket like? Um, you know, the first answer is it was a little bit like the uh, Star Wars bar scene. Um, <laughs> On the one hand, uh, this is very interesting. I've been to many international meetings before, but uh, uh, a large uh, Cecil B. DeMille-sized you know, cast of thousands of some very interesting characters. Um, I, I was able to uh, be part, first of all, of the U.S. delegation, but also uh, to be with uh, Ambassador Terry Kramer, the head of the delegation, as well as Ambassador Phil Revere, uh, Ambassador Susan King, who's uh, part of our mission in Geneva, um, and uh, Chairman Janikowski for a day on many of the bilateral meetings between a lot of key uh, countries. Um, and uh, it was interesting hearing a lot of the, um, the different perspectives. Uh, there were a number of surprises and twists and turns um, throughout the full two weeks, and I was only there for uh, most of the first week. Um, and you know the, the result is I, I, I have less of an optimistic view of, of actually what happened. You know, walking into uh, the treaty negotiation, we were told by the Secretary General of the ITU that first of all, the treaty would not touch the internet, and second of all, there would not be a hard vote taken. That historically, as Ambassador Gross knows, uh, these things are achieved uh, by consensus. It's the ITU tradition to have unanimous consensus. So the Secretary General said, A, it won't touch the internet. B, there will be uh, this unanimous consensus. Neither happened. Both of those were 180 degrees wrong. Um, and uh, in a way, you could have predicted that because the proponents of 
taking the internet away from the multi-stakeholder uh, bottom-up model are very determined, they're very patient and persistent incrementalists, and uh, the one-way ratchet of international regulation of the internet has begun, in my view. I won't blather on because I know we'll have a chance to talk about that some more, but it was a fascinating process. I think the United States and uh, the government, as well as industry and the uh, uh, civil society sector got started very late in its advocacy. I don't know if the result would have been any different, uh, but we did get started very late in our advocacy, and we cannot, we cannot make the same mistake as we work towards the ITU's plenipotentiary conference, which will culminate in November of 2014, but we need to be working on that today, immediately. Thank you. David, you were there as well, and uh, you should know that David was instrumental in uh, the drafting and passage of the House resolution with regard to, uh, to Wicked as well. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a moment, I think. Uh, but David, you were there. What were your impressions? How was this different than what you thought it would be like? Well, I'm, thank you, David, for organizing the panel and for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I don't think I can improve on Commissioner McDowell's description uh, as the, the cantina scene from Star Wars in terms of a description of the actual scene. So I, I think I'll focus on sort of um, what I was expecting and, and what I really got to see. Um, it was interesting to see both the interactions within our delegation and then certainly interactions with those that were not a part of our delegation. And uh, it's somewhat refreshing uh, having spent time working on this resolution uh, with my bosses in, in Congress and, and ultimately getting two unanimous votes in the House. Uh, ultimately, we, we also voted unanimously to uh, take the Senate's language when we, we finally passed uh, the resolution uh, to see groups come together uh, on an issue that we all felt really passionately about. Um, getting the House to vote unanimously once was, was challenging, uh, is challenging generally, but uh, in this case, everyone saw eye to eye on the issue and the importance of the issue. And that carried through to what we all saw within the delegation once you got to Dubai. And uh, it was um, heartening to see that carried through and see competitors um, that could be above the fray and see, uh, see the forest for the trees in this case. Um, and groups within the government that don't always see eye to eye on issues of policy all speaking from the same uh, song sheet. So. Uh, Within our delegation, I think that was the most um, interesting thing for me to see. Um, in our interactions with those outside the delegation, I, I learned a lot about what uh, we face going forward as a country in this arena. And I, I know you plan to get into the details, but um, the internet governance discussion is here to stay. Um, in our discussions with a, a lot of these other, other delegations from other member nations, uh, you could hear they have very real concerns about internet governance and that they are uh, not likely to uh, stop talking about it because the United States doesn't want to. And I think we also need to be looking at the way we interact with these folks going forward and be more, um, maybe more proactive. I mean, it's hard to say we not, haven't been proactive. Obviously, all the groundwork that was done by Ambassador Gross in, in, uh, in the last decade uh, was very proactive in this space. But we're going to have to continue to be vigilant and do a lot of groundwork with member nations around the world who have very real concerns about deployment of uh, networks in their country and, and the, uh, the other aspects that we're gonna go into in terms of security and, and finances of networks. Eric, you were there for the entire two weeks um, and you also have seen other ITU events. Tell us your impressions and what sort of lessons learned at that high level. Sure, uh, pleased to do so. And I'll take a, a, a little different focus for a moment um, and talk for a moment just about a, a couple of the positive things that we saw, learned, and even came away from. Um, certainly the areas of concern that resulted in a, in a no sign for the U.S. and 54 other countries are substantial and of cumulative effect, and so we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. But, but there are some important uh, achievements that also did happen here and that are part of the conversation going forward. Now, first of all, uh, th there really is a, a shared desire around the world to increase uh, the, the, the access and connectivity to services. And uh, that is, that is, with very rare exception, a uniform goal. What we saw, of course, is that there's just some very different visions about how to achieve it. Uh, and the U.S. and several other countries came in with what I believe is a, a very strong and proven track record of, of what has 
led to the explosion of services and uh, liberalized markets, private sector uh, led uh, competition, um, the multi-stakeholder process, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and there are other visions that are out there that have a much stronger government top-down role, and that's a battle that will be going on. Now, there were several instances of successes at the conference which give hope, I think, for how some of these issues can be worked on going forward if the facts are there to show what has led to such a dramatic explosion of services, the internet, everything we see here in Las Vegas. Um, there were some traditional telecom provisions that were very important, actually, at this conference. And in all the coverage that we've seen before and after, they really haven't been talked about. But in, indeed, uh, that 1988 model of single country, single carrier, and that all the agreements between carriers had to be subject to accounting rate government regulation. That was what was in the ITRs. Uh, in the new ITRs, through a consensus process and a lot of work from all regions getting around the table through every drafting session, uh, we have a new section in there that recognizes clearly that there can be commercial agreements entirely outside of the accounting rate, outside of the regulated regime, and that is now a section in there and it reflects uh, the way that exchanges can happen in competitive markets and that's a, I think a very good foundation. Uh, there also were some important areas that were agreed through consensus with new provisions talking about end user transparency and competitive uh, structures for mobile roaming, uh, new provisions in there on disability access uh, to telecommunication services and, and a few others. So, I mentioned those in opening uh, simply because there has not actually been uh, much recognition that there were some, uh, some positive things that occurred and uh, that occurred through very intense conversations from all regions and, and finding a way forward. And I, I take from that a, um, uh, a model and a positive hope that through outreach and serious conversations with the many countries that have pragmatic concerns they're trying to address to improve access in their countries, that, uh, that, that we will have a, a path forward and, and continue working on these issues as we must. Pablo, I know you were not physically there, but you had a whole team there that you work very closely with uh, on the U.S. delegation from Google. Can you talk a little bit about what you were hearing, but also a little bit about why Google at an tele international telecoms treaty? Good question. Um, so what, what was it like? Well, um, first of all, uh, there was a webcast available, at least certain parts of it, which was um, much like watching C-SPAN when there's not much going on in C-SPAN. So um, not like the Star Wars canteen, at least on, on the computer screen. Um, there has been a, a, a longstanding debate, uh, obviously, about legitimate concerns regarding to access, um, but also efforts by various governments uh, to restrict access, um, to uh, promote content regulation uh, for whatever purposes, and to extend that, um, that control over, over expression uh, to the internet. That is one of the things that we were concerned about. It's one of the reasons why we were there uh, and present, and it resulted in something that was really extraordinary. So I'll, I'll give some background details and, and, and some, some basic facts for those of you who haven't uh, kept up with, with what happened at the Wicket. So at the end of this process, um, 89 countries out of 193 member nations uh, voted in favor of this treaty. Um, 55 countries decided to not uh, sign the, uh, the, the treaty. And, and the reason for this, in large part, uh, and the reason why the U.S. was among those 55 countries, thanks to the leadership of, of Ambassador Kramer, thanks to the leadership of individuals like Commissioner McDowell, who, by the way, was an early and clear voice in, in this process, certainly thanks to the efforts of, of um, David Gross uh, in the WISIS and, and, and previous efforts. Um, the reason for this was that, that we, the United States and other, and other similarly uh, uh, inclined countries decided that they uh, were, would draw a red line around the concept of 
making sure that this was about telecommunications and not about the internet. And in fact, there is language that is not binding, but it basically uh, lays out a very different governance uh, model for, um, for the internet um, from what exists today in the international space. And then secondly, that, that you know, it wouldn't apply to, to things like content regulation. In fact, uh, what we see is that there is a provision that's nominally about spam um, that, that is contained in there that gives countries more flexibility to uh, potentially regulate unsolicited bulk electronic communications. That requires a judgment call about what is in the communication. It requires a judgment call about what, what types of communications are appropriate and what types of communications are not appropriate. Um, and as a result, what uh, was formerly a body uh, that was primarily focused on things like where satellites uh, should be orbiting uh, is now potentially putting it, getting a, a, a foothold uh, in the area of, um, of content regulation. For us, that's a, a, a big concern because, for example, if you look at um, recent data coming out of the Freedom House, out of 47 countries that, that, they, that they surveyed in, 20, in, in 2011, 19 countries passed legislation or regulations that were impacting free expression on the internet. That is not a great trend. Um, it is a trend that the United States has managed to avoid, uh, but it is not uh, potentially a trend that we're seeing um, internationally. So these are the types of concerns that, that, were, that were on the minds of not just Google, but other, other companies uh, that, that operate on the web. Sure, thank you, Pablo. John, you were also uh, spent a, a little time in uh, Dubai. Uh, Sorry. Give us your, your impressions and your takeaways that we can use going forward. Yeah, so this is my first international telecom treaty uh, event that I attended. And, um, you know, I was just really struck um, it wasn't exactly what I expected. You, you know, you went into this gigantic room with rows and rows of table, hundreds of people completely quiet because everyone had their uh, headsets on, you know, being translated. And it was interesting to me that you would see these big screens and there would be members there, particularly like elderly gentlemen who were very animated, perhaps from the Middle East, making their point. And then on the speaker, you heard this very feminine, <laughs> quiet voice in a very rational way. So I mean, it was sort of a disconnect. So I, I was really grateful to be there. But I think, and I can't remember who said this, but I think the thing that really struck me, and of course, you know, being in Washington, and we're lobbied quite a bit from different interests and competitive um, angles. But really, at this event, you saw that you know the dele U.S. delegation, the core delegation of the U.S. government folks, but also the full delegation with the private sector companies and the civil society groups, everyone rowing in the exact same direction. There was no daylight between the position. And it was just very affirming and um, very hopeful for the future as we go you know, forward, because as Commissioner McDowell said, this is you know, only the start, whatever, so we have to remain vigilant. Um, I think, and it is very important that the U.S. stay engaged in this, right? I mean, uh, telecom is, very, is a global sector. Um, I think uh, the Federal Communications Commission certainly has a, a big role to play going forward. I know it does a number every year of hundreds of consultations with, with different regulators from around the world. They come in. I think that's very important to reach out. I think, you know, it's uh, Chairman Janikowski at his event earlier today pointed out what, what we saw there were two strains of desire to, uh, you know, bring uh, intergovernment uh, internet regulation to the ITU, and one is from these authoritarian uh, regimes who see it sort of as a to repress free expression, but then the other would be from uh, some developing countries, third world countries that see it in terms of economic um, uh, priorities. And so I think, you know, certainly I'm not sure we, I don't know how we'll do on the authoritarian side, but certainly on the economic concerns, those countries I think we can do a lot of work going forward. I think that's that's very important. So. Well, let me, uh, let me turn uh, in for the next uh, couple of questions a little bit looking ahead, if I may. Uh, uh, let me begin by saying, in my view, one of the things that I think is misunderstood about the outcome of, of Wicked is there's been a lot of focus on the fact that 89 countries signed the treaty, uh, 55 countries, including the United States, most of Europe, a number of other uh, major uh, countries uh, decided not to sign uh, the treaty. Uh, but it, that masks, in my view, um, a little bit about where most of the other countries really are on Internet-related issues. Uh, 
I think great credit for the document, that the treaty document, that has obviously some fatal flaws from a U.S. perspective, uh, and there's no doubting that, as was noted by a number of the, the panelists. Uh, nevertheless, uh, our chairman of the wicket, who was the head, of, uh, the chairman of the regulator in the UAE, did an extraordinarily good job of bringing the text to a place that, despite the fact that there were a lot of very difficult uh, positions taken by other governments, including his own, I would quickly add, uh, nevertheless was pretty close to a document that was very good for industry and for many others. Um, and in fact, up until the last moment, the document that he presented, um, probably if it had gone forward, no one will ever know the answer to this, but probably the United States and maybe three or four other countries would have no decided not to sign and you would have had virtually all the other countries there in attendance sign. Now, uh, perhaps in a strange way, fortunately for the United States, uh, Iran uh, decided to meddle in what was already a reasonably well-cooked document and went ahead and in called for a vote, one of the votes that Commissioner McDowell just referred to, and had inserted as a result of a vote a human rights provision uh, that for the first time in my experience, provides governments with human rights rather than individuals with human rights. In this particular case, it was a human right having access to international telecommunication services, born, you'll not be surprised, from concern about sanctions uh, that a number of countries, including Iran, are very concerned about. The fact that for the first time that I'm aware of, a human rights was being given to governments in an international treaty resulted in the fact that most of Europe and, in fact, virtually all of Europe and many other governments decided they could not sign this stuff. So my question to the panel is, what is the takeaway from that? If I'm right, and really we were more isolated on the internet-related provisions, the spam provisions that Pablo talked about, the internet uh, resolution that's not part of the treaty but attached to it, uh, the scope and so forth of the treaty, what does that mean for us going forward? How do we get out of being perceived to be perhaps more isolated? Commissioner? I think you point out something that's very, very important uh, for all of us to, to start working on uh, immediately. Uh, and that is while it could have been worse in a way, uh, it certainly could have been better, but that the sentiment overall is to give the ITU more authority in this space. Now, before December, you had ITU leadership and several important and active member states already arguing that the 1988 ITRs, International Telecommunications Regulations, gave the ITU jurisdiction over the internet. There's a PowerPoint presentation posted on the ITU's website, as a matter of fact, saying this very clearly, that it already had jurisdiction there back in 1988 before anyone had really, uh, except for maybe a fewer than 100,000 users had ever heard of the term internet. So what this means is, uh, regardless of uh, the nuances in the, uh, the new language post last month, uh, there will be countries and maybe ITU leadership who will argue that this new language gives the ITU unbridled authority in this space. I'm not saying that's the U.S. government's position, certainly, certainly not mine uh, personally, but this will, be, this will happen. There will be those out there, and maybe they're already saying it, that uh, the ITU's uh, jurisdiction is, is unlimited. And then the other troubling point is um, you you very diplomatically, and this is why I'll never work at the State Department because I'm just not diplomatic enough, but uh, David Gross is the epitome of a, of a diplomat who's uh, sort, of like, sort of like watching silk uh, weave its way through a crowd. Uh, I'm more like barbed wire. Uh, but um, Europe, <laughs> Europe uh, almost voted for a huge expansion of the ITRs um, into this space. Uh, and not necessarily every country in Europe, but the, the bulk of Europe. And, and we tend to think of Europe as being similarly minded um, in this regard. So as we go forward, 
into this plenty pot, which I will completely oversimplify to call sort of a constitutional convention of the ITU. Uh, I think the United States, and this is an important nuance here, the United States and any other countries that are like-minded need to fundamentally rethink the ITU's role. Now, the ITU has evolved over time. The ITU can be a forum for very important uh, purposes, uh, such as uh, spectrum harmonization. Department of Defense, private sector, satellite companies, we all need a forum where countries can work out through treaty uh, how to handle spectrum. But when the ITU starts venturing into this next area, I think, you know, such as, as the next area of, of um, regulation of the internet, at many different levels, as Pablo pointed out, both operations and content. Um, and you know, there are very few things that can unify Google and AT&T and have them sitting peacefully beside each other on a panel. <laughs> but no, seriously, we need to fundamentally question the ITU's role and our involvement in all aspects. We want to be engaged, and that helps shape things, but this is an organization that has greatly expanded its jurisdiction and will continue to do so because the countries that have accomplished what they accomplished last month are patient and persistent incrementalists. So I do, I refer to it before as a one-way ratchet, and I think the speed of that ratchet turning is only going to accelerate over time and over just the next few years. And not to, oops, throwing my pen, uh, not to, to sound melodramatic, but freedom, global freedom and prosperity cannot afford that. Pablo, you look like you want to jump in, and then I'm going to turn to Eric. Just a, with a really quick nuance, which is that, that you know, there are some who, who view what happened at the wicket and, and believe that, in many ways, it didn't really give countries any additional authority that they didn't previously have. Um, and that, in fact, more than anything else, it provided these countries with, with cover for things that they might want to do domestically. And, you know, it really leads to, to a point about you know, in building on, on Commissioner McDowell's uh, uh, points, that really what we, we do need to focus on the next steps. And one of the things that I would just encourage us to think about is not just kind of evangelism abroad, but also walking the walk domestically. Um, there are, you know, there have been efforts to, various efforts to regulate uh, the web, um, over, you know, most recent example obviously was the, uh, you know, SOPA and PIPA debate um, uh, last year. And, you know, and those, all those efforts are really looked at by, by various countries as examples um, of what they could and should be doing uh, domestically. And I would just encourage us to, to, to think about setting the gold standard in the United States domestically so that we, we can then, when we're doing our engagement uh, abroad, you know, really try to maybe hopefully pause um, this kind of, you know, this inevitable march towards international regulation by, by showing the example of what the U.S. has done and showing success in, in domestic regulation and legislation. Eric, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, no, it's a terrific lead-in, and as Pablo is saying, you know, in a way we start by editing the title of this panel just to say some countries want to regulate the Internet. That's the starting point, and, and working through other institutions is uh, uh, a vehicle for that. Now. Uh, point is absolutely correct that a, a starting point in any compelling outreach that the U.S. will make will be to have a principled, principled position here. And, um, and, and we see and hear it many times if there are examples of U.S. activity that's interpreted as regulating the Internet, then, then the response when we're telling the IT or other countries that it's improper to do so is met with a certain degree of uh, uh, apprehension and it's critical to keep in mind it's with the internet just not content and services it's internet interconnection agreements and it's internet networks and these were all part and parcel of the discussion in in the ITRs and it's all very important for how we think about our policies here now as we do our outreach and as Commissioner McDowell said we must do more of it the point for optimism can be that Again, the 
the facts of how successful the internet has been over the last couple of decades are compelling. And when, when you have compelling facts on your side, you have to do a better <coughs> job of working with people. And the vast majority of countries by the numbers have pragmatic concerns that they're trying to address, uh, whether of development or of security or reduction of spam. And we simply have to do a better job of making the multi-stakeholder institutions that are in existence more really accessible, not just accessible, you can come if you can afford and show up, but bring the show to town in, in effect, make this information more available and, and spend more time doing this. And this is where we have to commit our efforts because many of the issues has been said before are pragmatic, they're economic, and, um, and I think we can, um, we can we can do a better job of, of working with people to address their concerns to show that uh, forms of regulation, either national or through uh, a UN institution, uh, aren't, aren't necessary. David, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the points that were that were made uh, on the walk the walk. I think I think Pablo used the term walk the walk. We need to in this country when we are uh, addressing the rest of the world, and I couldn't agree more. But one of the problems we face when we were in Dubai, and one of the things I heard from some of the you know, other member nations we spoke to is that the US seemed to be taking a bit of a do as I say, not as I do approach. Uh, we were telling the world not to get the government involved in the internet. And to be blunt, we had net neutrality thrown back in our faces. And we can argue till the cows come home here or we're blue in the face whether net neutrality is a good idea or not. But we have to bear in mind that when we are in these venues, um, reasonable people can disagree about whether or not net neutrality is a good idea. And in the same vein, one man's security in these discussions is another man's censorship. And I think we need to bear that in mind as we are dealing with folks around the world that we take a, a nuanced approach to this that recognizes that, you know, while we may view what we do as consistently white hat in this country, um, it may not be viewed quite the same way by others. Um, and to sort of hit on one other point, uh, you know, you made a, a bit of an aside about AT&T and, and Google being at the same table and not fighting with each other. And I think it's important for us to uh, hit home that the internet, when we're having these discussions, is both networks and content. And one of the things that we got to see as we were heading towards the later days of the wicket is uh, attempts by some of those that wanted to insert cybersecurity or security provisions into the ITRs. Uh, uh, as an attempt to drive a wedge between networks and content and to define the internet as the content providers and not the network providers. Uh, you can't have one without the other. And I think one of the strengths of our delegation was the fact that we had network providers standing next to content providers saying we're not going to discuss the internet at this conference. It's not what this conference is for. And I, I think we should bear that in mind as we go forward, that there will be, as Commissioner McDowell puts it, consistent incrementalism to try and separate the idea of content from the networks that ride on them. And, and having the, you, the ITU as the regulator of either of them in the internet age is not something that's consistent with the multi-stakeholder model that has let the internet thrive so far. John, you want to talk a little bit about your views on the international aspects of domestic policy making? Well, I can certainly talk about Senator Rockefeller's views. So okay. I, I think it's important not to, um, to misread um, U U.S. domestic policy to protect a free and open internet as some way encouraging some of these uh, authoritarian regimes who would like to restrict access or, or impose their policies on the world, which are exact opposite of a free and open internet. So, I think we just need to keep that in mind. And also, I think you know, it, it, it would be disappointing for certain domestic stakeholders to, to use that point um, for domestic uh, purposes. I think it sort of undermines what we saw at the wicket of all the stakeholders, the government, the private, coming together. So I think that would, that would be disappointing. So. Let me turn to the audience here for some questions. Uh, who all has? A question right over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the speakers. Julio Vega from the Mexican Internet Association. Uh, in an increasing number of uh, countries, there are a discussion going on about Internet and human rights, uh, the access to Internet and human rights. What do you think about that? Is that positive for the Internet environment to regulate internet as a human right? 
I think the internet and the mobile internet in particular has done more to improve the global human condition than almost any invention we can point to, certainly in our lifetimes, but maybe ever. And uh, the best way to keep that going is to look at what has worked. And what has worked has been to keep the net as unfettered uh, from government interference as possible, even if that government interference is cloaked in some alleged noble purpose. So um, I'm not quite sure what it means uh, in international law to call something a human right. I think we have to be careful, at least in our country, to uh, avoid creating an, an entitlement. But what we've seen is the, the power of computing skyrocket and the cost of it plummet so that even the dumbest of phones or uh, devices, internet connected devices out there have far more computing power than the entire Apollo program had that put people on the moon. So we need to continue that trend, to continue the development of computing power, which is in the hands of people who may be illiterate or semi-literate, uh, and reduce the cost. And we see those trend lines being, they're very encouraging. Uh, so let's build on what has worked and not try to change that model, because I think it will do more to uh, spread freedom and prosperity than anything else really we have going on. I mean, these are fundamental things that are changing. When you see uh, a, a villager or a, a farmer, let's say, in, in Africa um, can find the right price for their produce, which they've never had before in all of human history, that fundamentally changes their lives because they're making more money, they can buy more property, their children's lives improve, or it can be things such as just fundamentally finding uh, drinkable water nearby, which is actually one of the number one uh, problems facing the world right now, or medicine for a sick child. All of this is happening because of the mobile internet, and that is happening because it has been unfettered. When the state starts to step in, uh, that will slow down. Anybody else in the panel like to make a comment? If not, I think we've got a next question. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about um, the U.S. and the ITU and all of this. I think there's some who have suggested that in light of what um, happened in Dubai, maybe it's time to rethink U.S. involvement in the ITU and support for the ITU. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that and, and what are the risks of, you know, of, of, of the U.S. Um, you know, sort of taking that course. Eric, you want to start? I would like to say a, a couple of words on that. Um, I, I have concerns with that sentiment because there are some extraordinarily important things in, that the ITU does and important equities that uh, the U.S. as a whole has in um, ensuring participation uh, in this institution, which is not going away. Uh, fundamental to many of the innovations that we're talking about, and particularly when we talk about the mobile broadband evolution, just, just as an example, is the allocation of spectrum, which uh, in coming years um, we need more of, and ideally um, harmonized in bands across multiple regions. This is something done in the R sector at the ITU that is done uniquely there. And um, the development sector of the ITU is a very important place where uh, many of the forms of outreach that we're talking about to work with parties on the policies that we believe in, uh, the training that needs to be done can be done there. So I bring these as examples. You have to remember as well that for these other uh, aspects of the ITU and when we go, when we go to work with countries around the world to achieve things very important to ensuring that international telecommunications continues. It is the same delegates uh, in those sectors as are, yeah, we're attending in Dubai. And so um, the U.S. has a, a, a longstanding and, and needs to have an ongoing uh, relationship uh, with the ITU, with the other member states that participate there. And it's, I think, critical to keep that in mind, uh, even as we uh, work through uh, the issues that we worked through in Dubai last month. Paulo, did you want to comment as well? You might want to rope that into sort of next steps. I mean, we have a ITU has a World Telecommunications <coughs> Policy Forum coming up in May. 
We have the plenty potentiary that a number of people have talked about in 2014, which I would note not only, as the Commissioner and others have noted, uh, is a treaty conference that goes to the, uh, the core of the ITU, but also it will be when uh, there will be new elections for the leadership of the ITU. And any organization is, of course, influenced by who leads it. And we'll have a new Secretary General and a new Deputy Secretary General. Pablo? Commissioner, you. No, you go first. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, no, I, I, I mean, personally, I don't think that the <coughs> stepping out of the ITU is, you know, opting out of this is, uh, uh, is going to do anything. I mean, we, we have to have, uh, you know, a strong voice with, with a strong opinion about how, um, how this should all work out. Um, I'm, I'm, and I apologize, I'm reflecting a little bit about the, uh, the, the conversation before about um, uh, domestic versus international, what we can do uh, domestically. You know, it's, it's funny, I, you know, I, I tend to, to generally agree that um, kind of de deregulatory approach uh, is, you know, has, has led to um, you know, many benefits, economic growth and, and so forth. I will say though that there are, there are definitely laws in the United States um, that have been pretty critical to the, the growth of the web in the U.S. and, and then by extension uh, internationally. So for example, you know, Section 215 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act critical um, for a uh, provider like Facebook or, or Twitter, you know, you're hosting third-party user-generated content um, and you need to make sure that, that you as the host are not liable um, necessarily for, for, you know, what your users are saying on your platform. Well, that has been a, a key, key part, I think, of, of, um, of the web's growth. Um, Oh, you know, over the last decade or so, and so there are, you know, there are things that that, that you you know you'd want to tweak that are really kind of consistent with, you know, First Amendment principles that, that you just kind of want to make sure that that when when we're talking to um, our international counterparts, they understand that there are these components um, to to American law uh, that, that have been very very critical to to, the, to to our growth. But again, I mean, in terms of opting out of the ITU, I, I personally don't think that that's the right idea. If I can add a, a nuance, because it's, it's a nuanced answer, this isn't black and white. Again, to kind of repeat what I said before, there are many important functions that the ITU carries out. But the trend with the, the huge step forward to regulate the internet is really a trend to take the old telecommunications regulations, international settlements, and other such things, and put that on the, on the internet. Um, I think with any organization, international organization, that is headed in a direction uh, that we disagree with, I think it's constructive and positive for our national interest, for America's national interest, to start to rethink exactly how we're going to approach. That doesn't mean you necessarily walk away from it. Obviously, we, we really can't. It, it was said earlier, I think, by Eric, that it's, IT is going to be around for a long time and, and does carry out many important functions that we like, that are important to the to the country. But when it starts heading in a direction that we were told it wouldn't head into just a few weeks ago, and there wouldn't be a vote on, and both of those ended up being falsehoods, um, I think it is in our national interest. We all have a duty, and Congress has a duty, and the State Department has a duty to re-engineer our approach. It may be, as Ambassador uh, uh, Gross was uh, pointing out, he, I'm not putting words in his mouth, he didn't go this far, but to say, with the plenty pot that's coming up in 2014, but the road to that starts started already, uh, we're on that road. With that plenty pot, that is an opportunity, it's a threat, and it's an opportunity for us to try to reshape the I2 in a way that we think is positive and constructive. And the, the crime in all this is, you know, the United States is a big, strong country. Uh, we have some big, strong companies represented here uh, on this panel. But the direction the ITU is headed in um, will hurt the people of the developing world the most. Uh, and it tends to be those countries that have authoritarian regimes. And authoritarian regimes fear a free and open internet. They fear it politically. And they don't care about the economics. Uh, if you look at China as an easy example, um, it is, you know, there have been demonstrations just in the past few days in China about internet censorship. And those are growing, by the way, and that's a, a story to follow in the coming months and years. But these authoritarian regimes 
see what happened in the Arab Spring, which of course the Arab Spring sort of has soured, but what initially happened with the Arab Spring was the power of internet connectivity enabled people um, of the humblest means and backgrounds to communicate and organize against their government. And dictators don't like that. So, and then you know, my reference an illustration of, of uh, farmers being able to raise their standard of living and improve their, their living conditions as a result of connectivity and the information that comes with it. So all of that is at stake in the developing world, the people of the developing world will be harmed the most. So this is what we're fighting against, um, and it really is a crying shame, but I think the United States and any true allies we have left on this, I think you said four or five maybe, <laughs> um, we gotta start somewhere I guess, um, really need to think how, what can we do in a to accomplish something positive and constructive at that 2014 Plenty Pot. Um, but we need to, to think in an unconventional way and think from scratch our approach to the ITU. And we could use uh, action and leadership from Congress and the executive branch as well. Well, this comes up often with regard to the United Nations in general. There are plenty of people in the Congress who think the United States should withdraw from the entire United Nations. The fact of the matter is, though, we have to be in the room. Even if we're outvoted, if we try to take our ball and go home, we may find that we don't have the ball anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, you could take a different approach. Uh, major U.S. companies and the countries that are still on our side and some of the ones who wake up would find that uh, the predominance of the, the technology, the predominance of the, the, the uh, investment and involvement in the Internet is with those countries you could form something different to try to address some of these issues and try to let this go a different direction. But I don't think it would work. I think uh, over the long run, you've got to be in the room trying to influence the process. And some people will learn the hard way, but eventually I think they'll learn that they can't go the route that they want to go. Well, it seems like an appropriate way to end our session. Uh, comments from the chairman, uh, beginning and ending our session, and the note that uh, we've got to be in the room because we now have to leave the room. So with that, let us thank uh, the chairman and our panelists. Well,